Hello and welcome to Happy Horror Time. I am Tim Murdoch. And my name is Matt Emmert. And today's special guest is none other than the creator of the Final Destination franchise. What started as a spec script for an X-Files episode went on to launch one of the top horror franchises with five movies so far and a sixth one on the way. But this horror screenwriter is no one trick pony. He's also written many other genre films like Tamara, the 2008 Day of the Dead remake, Dead Awake. And most recently, he made his feature film directorial debut with the 2020 mystery thriller Don't Look Back. Please welcome to the podcast our friend and an inspiration to horror writers everywhere, Jeffrey Reddick. Thank you for that um, introduction. I don't know how to top that. (laughs) <laughs> no, <we're not. laughs> like, like, uh, no, how much um, inspiring people? Well, yay, of course you are. Are you serious? Like, I, as a um, like, as a like, as a horror lover, as a someone who wishes they could be writing and working on horror films, like, your career is very inspiring to any horror lover, yeah. And whenever I see you, you are writing, <laughs> yeah. No, I know, <laughs> I am a writer. <laughs> yeah. so, So, okay, look, we love going back to like the very beginning. And I read some really cool stuff about how you got your start in the business. So I want you to tell me if this is all true and then tell us more about it. Like I read that when you were 14, you wrote a treatment for a Nightmare on Elm Street prequel, sent it to New Line. And that started like a correspondence between you and Robert Shea that led to an internship there when you were in college. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, that's it. Um, no, <laughs> no but there's, there's more. There's there's some fun details to that. Yeah, no, when I was 14, I saw um, the original Nightmare on Elm Street, which is my favorite movie of all time, um, bar none. Uh, and I, you know, Little Hillbilly in Kentucky, I watched it on <laughs> I watched it on the um, hood of my friend uh, Tony Calhoun on his dad's truck with the CB turned on because we couldn't afford to go to the actual theater to see it. But it, we lived behind the theater. So um, we were pirating movies before pirating was cool. Nice. Um, and I, it blew my, the movie blew my mind. So I went home and I banged out a story. Um, I call it a treatment now because I know movie terminology. But at that point, it was just a story for a prequel. And I called information in New York. And thank God this was right before, because New Line was really this house that Freddie built, like, New Line, Nightmare on Elm Street made night, uh, New, uh, New Line Cinema a major player. Luckily, I got them right when they put the first one out. So they, they hadn't blown up to the point where I would never be able to do this now. But um, yeah, I sent it. I called information, got the address, mailed him the treatment. Um, he sent it back and said it was unsolicited and they couldn't read it. I didn't know what that meant. So I had to look up unsolicited. And then I I sent it back to him and I was like, um, excuse me, sir, but I've spent three dollars on your movies, which I had pirated it. But I did, re- I did rent it on, I did rent it, I did rent it a lot <laughs> when it came so out. Maybe three fifty four dollars. Right? Yeah, <laughs> I spent, I've spent like three dollars on your movies, so I think you can take five minutes to read my story. Wow. And so he wrote back and he said, "Thank you for your aggressive introduction," and he, and taking the time and he read it and he him and his assistant joy man who's no longer with us but i adore that woman as much as i do bob um yeah they they stayed in touch with me from age 14 to 19 they would send me movie posters and tchotchke i learned what tchotchkes meant you know which is cool um and they would just send me stuff and and read scripts and um, when I was 19, I was going to uh, college at a college called Berea College in Kentucky, which is an amazing college. And I was studying acting because my dream at that point was to be like the first biracial centerfold in Teen Beat magazine. Like that was my that was my dream. You that was my, big from a yeah. young age. Oh, wow. my God. Yes. Um, and so I got into a summer program at the American Acad- of Academy of Dramatic Arts in New York. And while I was there for the summer, they offered me an internship at New Line. And then I ended up getting an agent and then I was like, well, screw school. <laughs> like, um, but the reality is uh, non-traditional casting was not on anybody's radar in the 90s. Uh, I mean, it just wasn't a reality at all. Like, because my agent's like, you're like an, she said, you're an ethnic boy next door, like an ethnic Michael J. Fox type. And they don't write roles, you know, for, for ethnic people <laughs> for boy next door they just weren't cat they, you know that was just the reality so it, it yeah. you know when i tell some people that they're shocked now but i'm like that's just how that's just how it was and um she's like i could you know i could probably get you you know maybe a, a guest 
you know, star role on the Cosby show at some point, I would, I'm like, Oh, that thinking back, that would have been great. That, but, um, <laughs> it's such a shame, like hearing this, like, I'm not surprised because I know what things are like uh, back then, but it's such a shame that it was such limited roles. It's like, Oh, okay. The Cosby show. You're like, no, there's other shows and movies and yeah. things out yeah. there. Yeah. Any <laughs> show. Yeah. Cause, cause I mean, really the, the thing was like, if I, if I knew how to rap or play basketball, there were guest spots for stuff like that. I will say, though, um, when I was at the American Academy of Dramatic Arts, since I was from Kentucky, I think I was the only person that didn't know that one of the other uh, uh, young ladies in the class with me was like the daughter of a casting director at ABC. And her and I hit it off like this. And she ended up like getting me like a bunch of background work on all my children Ooh, um, I know, I, I know, I know. And so you're I was, speaking Tim's language. I was, as soon as he I, was so. I was at Hula Hands and I was on campus and I got to meet like Susan Lucci and work with her and all the I, I was actually there like the day that. Um, um, oh, my God. I love her. What's her name? Um, has a talk I, show. I watched Tim, the bold and the beautiful, Tim but I I definitely know Susan Lucci and and I definitely know all my. Going to say Tim name every actor on the bold and the beautiful. Guy. Well, I could do that, but no, I don't want to. <laughs> this isn't the bold and the beautiful podcast. It's Jeffrey Reddick's podcast. No, no, but um um uh, oh Kelly Ripa when Kelly Ripa's character oh, okay. first first came on, um she started off as this like dyed black haired like biker chick, and yes. then they morphed her into the yeah. So I was I was like I worked as an extra on the day that she started, and she was so sweet. Susan Lucci, just a quick story because she's one of the nicest, most professional people I've ever met in my life. Um, after I'd worked on this show for maybe a year doing background, and I had a I had a one liner I delivered some fertility um, information to Susan Lucci and Jack Montgomery. It was a big deal. Oh, um, but. My sister was in the military and, and, you know, loved Susan Lucci. And I just finally, you know, had felt comfortable enough talking to her to ask her if I could get a picture signed for my sister. And she's like, sure. And she said, come on back. So she took me back to her dressing room and she picked out a bunch of them. And she said, you know, I don't want to send her too many, but like pick three of them that you like. You know, she was like the sweetest person and I adore her. Um, so anyway, cut to no acting other than that. <laughs> <laughs> wait, wait, but I'm so then did you prefer acting at that point to writing? Like, would you uh, oh, yeah. were you trying to pursue? Oh, OK. OK, yeah, that was my that, that, that was my goal um, was always to, to act and um, writing. English happened to be my s second favorite subject. And I, I loved writing as well, but I loved acting more. Um, and so, you know, I once I realized that, you know, how the business was, I was like, well, screw it. I'll just write roles for myself but you know i kept killing teenagers as i kept growing up so it's like well unless i'm playing a cw teenager um this isn't gonna this isn't gonna happen so, so i mean like nightmare on Elm street was your number one did, did any other horror films like like get on your radar oh uh, yeah i mean once yeah. Uh, yeah i mean me and my friends like i mean we were horror goons back in the day like it, for for us it was like we wanted to find the bloodiest, scariest movies out there because everybody was like, that's disgusting. And, you know, my, <laughs> my friends were straight. So, of course, they they wanted boobies um, in their movies, too. So, I mean, we watched ev all the standards like the Friday the 13th, um, Texas, Ch like every every movie that you can imagine. You know, we've faces of death. Um, I'm waiting for you to say Halloween. Come on, Jeff. Oh, I was I was going to. I thought, but I got <laughs> I, I got distracted when you pointed the camera. I, I'm sorry you. for our listeners. Yeah, I, I just I just moved the camera to show my. I'm always wearing a Halloween shirt. I know, but I feel like, like for Jeffrey's eyes, that probably looked like you were showing at your crotch. I That's was what, not. I was. I, I, was I not. thought you guys were. I was like, oh, it's a crotch shot. All of a sudden, suddenly <laughs> they're going. Oh, see, so we like to to spice things up, Jeffrey, and we just throw in crotch <laughs> shots. No, no, I was showing Jeffrey my Halloween shirt. Sorry, go on. I was just waiting. I was like, is he going to say Halloween? Is he going to say? No one's ever heard of it. Of course, I'm going to say Halloween. It's 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 one of my top top ten as well. Um, but you know the the bigger movies that really influenced me, like I found Suspiria when I was young. Oh, uh, good one. Or Suspiria, I guess. Um, and love that. Uh, Night of Living Dead, Psycho. Um, you know, Halloween. Uh, I loved One Dark Night for some reason. I always, I always, I always. Tom McLaughlin's making a remake. So I, I I made the mistake one time of asking him at a convention going, do you know who has the remake rights to One Dark Night? And he's like, I'm doing it. 
Now, I, I get along with him. Oh, uh, we've become so such fr- good friends after that. He's amazing. If but, anyone who doesn't know who that is, that's the director of Friday 13th Part 6, Jason Lives. Go oh on. yeah, and apparently, yeah, and apparently he's like the coolest person. Everyone, oh, in, like the, all the so all the Friday documentaries, like they rave about this guy, the director. He's so not. Nice. He's just so. That's what I love about like ninety nine percent of the horror filmmakers and actors and actresses I've met have been like, and I'm sure you you know you notice this too. Have been really just down to earth, regular people, and it, it's you, you expect it, but I think that. The, there's no such there's no other fandom like horror fandom mm-hmm. you know like you don't have romantic comedy conventions you you have specific movie conventions for sci-fi like you know star trek and battles you know you have things like that but the horror community is just like so um supportive and passionate and and it's just really a great thing to be a part of very um, faithful yeah 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 i have to throw Candyman out there too because Candyman oh. blew my mind oh of course um, and, and your thoughts on the uh, the latest installment? Did you enjoy that one? Um, the original blew my mind. Ah! <laughs> okay, we'll leave it at that. No, no, no. You know what? I I, I know how to I know how to say this. Um, I think the the new one I appreciated what it was trying to do, but I also feel like it was there were probably like seven different messages that the movie was trying to get across, and it's hard enough to get across one or two strong thematic messages. So I think when you're trying to cram too many in there and then, you know, I didn't care for necessarily what they decided to do with the Candyman mythology as far as I thought it could have been interesting, but it was so brushed on like there's literally a, with all the little. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's many Candymans out there. Yeah. Um, uh, so, you know, I, I thought it was an interesting movie. Um, but it just doesn't hold a candle to the original. No, that's a fair, fair assessment. So uh, moving on to Final Destination, I, I know oh, yeah. I, I know you've told this story a million times, but I'd love for you to tell it again for our listeners. Can you take us through how you came up with the story and just how it went from a spec script for X-Files to a feature film? Yeah. Um, well, the uh, seed of the idea came um, when I was going home to visit my family in Kentucky um, there, there's a good Kentucky store for both both the first two that so that's why I love telling it. But I, I read an article about this woman who was taking a um, she was on vacation and her mother called her the night before she was supposed to come home and said, "Don't take the flight you're on tomorrow. I have a bad feeling about it." So she changed flights and then she read that the pl- plane that she was on crashed. Oh, so cool. that put the idea in my head, but I didn't have a story for it. You know, I just thought, "Oh, that's weird." And I'm on a plane. Yay. I know. Uh, what a great, great article to read. I know. <laughs> Enjoy. And then once I decided I was going to really pursue acting, you know, you needed to get an agent. And to get an agent, you had to write a spec script for something that was already on television. So I love the X-Files. And I decided to use that setup, like, with Scully's brother, Charles, who's the brother that we didn't see much of in the show. Like, we saw the other brother all the time, but poor Charles. I think he may have shown up in one episode. Um, so I wrote, I used her brother as the guy who had the premonition. People start dying. He's a suspect. The X-Files, have, they have to solve it. But um, I never submitted it. That's the only thing that, that's the only piece of history. It's always like, oh, it was, it was a, it was a, either a rejected X-Files script or a script that went to the X-Files and James and Glenn turned it into a feature. But I never actually submitted it to the X-Files because my friends at New Line were like, this is a great script idea you need to write this as a feature so i got an agent from the script and yeah then i just i started writing um i wrote a treatment for it a feature length treatment for it and um even though i worked at the studio i i kind of knew the business enough to know that i needed to bring on producers so i went to craig perry and warren zide um who had a first deal at new line and they had done just an american pie and um my friend chris bender who now has his own company um, started working as their assistant. So he's like, Hey, we're look, we're looking for horror stuff. Send us over three of your ideas. So I sent over three ideas and they sparked to um, flight 180 is what it was called at the time. And um, originally it was, it was all adults um, that had, you know, an adult had the premonition. So it was very much more in line with part two. Uh, but then Scream came out, which is a, another one of my favorites. Then you gotta and go back to they're teens. Like, they're like, get the teens. You gotta go. Here. Yeah, you know where that's going. So it's like, well, teens are hot again. So let's go. Let's make them all teenagers. And um, honestly, it was a tough sell. Like even with the producer, 
we worked on it so much with New Line, um, but they could not, they were bumping on having a death be the killer. They're like, you know, you can't fight it. it we don't understand. And we're like, that's the whole point. You can't fight it. Like, it, that's the scary part. And they're, we're not sure. And then finally, finally, Warren's like, well, if you guys pass, we're going to take it over, over to Dimension. And then they're like, we'll buy it. <laughs> we'll uh, do it. Because, you know, because they, you know, I think they knew that there was something special there. It's just that they were, it's when it's something that hasn't been done in that you have a slasher movie, basically, where the slasher is death and you, they just weren't sure about how to do it. And then as, you know, very nicely karmic, it did end up with James Wong and Glenn Morgan from the X-Files. Um, we went to Clyde Barker first. Uh-huh. Um I know that was that's always an interesting bit of of information, but we went to Clyde Barker first, and he passed on it. And um, then I remember Bob came up to me at at the office. He's like, "What do you think about this? You know, James Wong and Glenn Morgan, these guys from the X Files." I'm like, "Fucking love," because some of the, they did some of my favorite episodes. So I was very excited um, that it to get them on board. Um, I love the, Glenn Morgan. Yeah. And, you know, we we actually had Kristen Cloak on the podcast um, and talked about just a few months ago and talked about um, um, Final Destination and um, Black Christmas and everything. And, you know, who obviously who's married to Glenn Morgan. But, you know, I, I know that that you had written the original screenplay for Final Destination. Then James Wong and Glenn Morgan, I think, did some rewrites. Did they what did they end up changing from your original script? Were there any major plot points that differed or characters? Um, they, they changed, it, it's, it's an interesting process cause they changed, um, the, the biggest change they made, which I actually think made the franchise what it is as opposed to, I think my version was very much a, a, a horror fan, like horror fans would have loved it. It was very nightmare on Elm street. Um, death's MO in that version was that because it fucked up the first time, it couldn't just come back and get them. So it basically tor- like psychologically tormented the kids till they committed suicide, oh. which is a little heavy. Um, so they changed it to the kind of Rube Goldberg thing, which kind of did the death is all around us, which I think made it more, again, for people that don't necessarily like horror movies, made it more palpable. Um, so that changed a lot of the, the specific stuff but but it's still most of the stuff is still the same like in my version like alex's best friend todd rigged up a noose well he he'd been he's a he was a preacher son who'd been stealing stuff stealing money you know and selling drugs at school i mean the kids were a little bit more um that's kind of Tim's high school experience. Yeah, I stole all the time. Tim, all the time. time he sold drugs. Based For all on the Tim drugs. Murdoch. All the drugs. Um, I love drugs. Uh, I'm kidding, I don't. So, like in this, in the in the original in the original version of the script, like Todd calls his father. We see this kind of creepy scene where he's being tormented by you know the people that died in the crash, and you should have been with you know. You should have been with us and blah, blah, blah. Well, I and like that already. That like gives me the heebie jeebies. I would yeah. love to see some of that. Anyway, go on. <laughs> no, no. So then, so Todd's calling his father up and his father's on, got him on speakerphone and Todd's apologizing and he's, I'm sorry, you know, and, but, and they, his father could tell something's wrong. So he's rushing home and he gets to the, the garage and he hits the garage door opener and he hears Todd choking and he realizes that Todd's rung, set a noose up in the garage and hung himself when his father opened the door. So, you know, so in the new version, obviously, Todd gets hung in the shower. So there's like different deaths, but they're still like, you know, like in my version, the asshole jock like throws himself in front of a subway train. And, you know, after picking on his girlfriend, you know, Terry Chaney, you know. So, yeah, so they they did. They came with a real go birthing, which I'm actually very grateful for, because I think I think my version would have been a. I think it would have been a Nightmare on Elm Street kind of hit, hopefully, but we didn't have a Freddy Krueger, so, but it wouldn't have had the kind of widespread appeal that I think the franchise got with the Rube Goldberg stuff. Well, all, all in all, I mean, I, w- I will never forget seeing this movie for the first time, because first off, not only how realistic and terrifying the plane crash scene was, but just, I remember thinking, actually, coming from someone who loves slashers, how cool of an idea it was that, like, if you cheated death, death was coming back to get you in some way. So, like, I thought it was just a genius idea, especially at that time, like, you know, sometimes it's scary. You know how they always say sometimes what you can't see is scarier than what you yeah. can. So I, I think like 
like something coming after you that you really can't fight is such a cool idea. Yeah, it left you. I remember walking out of the theater like just with I, I hate to use the word heebie jeebies, but I mean, it's like I did. I had them. <laughs> but you did. I had them. <laughs> no, yeah. It, it, yeah, it, it really was. And, you know, and then one little tiny thing, but I feel like I know the answer to this just because I've always read like conflicting accounts. Remember the TWA Flight 800 crash where there was a bunch of high school students that yeah. were on the trip or class trip to Paris? Yeah. I figure you probably wrote or came up with this before any, I mean, well, you oh, yeah. have kids. Okay, so there's nothing, because there's so many scenes, uh, um, pages that are like, based on the TWA Flight 800 no, crash. No, no. Okay. <laughs> but, what ha- but what did happen, um, which was was certainly a choice from somebody <laughs> that was, I, I think was tacky, is they did use footage from that crash in the movie when they sh- showed it on the news. Um, so that was that was something that was very tacky. But but people don't understand how long it takes movies to get made, because I think that crash happened like the year before the movie came out. I forget exactly when it but but it's like, yeah, there's no way you can write a movie, <laughs> make it. And, you know, um, so, yeah, that the crash hadn't happened um, when I, I wrote remember, it. I remember seeing it and thinking, wait, weren't there high school students that were on a Paris class trip in that crash? And so like immediately your mind goes there. But then obviously, like you said, hearing more about it, especially the fact that your original script had adults, obviously you weren't yeah. going off of, of that. OK, so Final Destination ends up grossing like I think it's like 112 million internationally. And then New Line contacts you about a sequel. And I noticed that you're credited with coming up with the story for Final Destination 2, but not writing the screenplay. So for us non-entertainment industry folk, what specifically does that mean? Like, did you do a treatment and then hand it off to the writers? Yeah, I mean, what happened, it's it, typical Hollywood. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, I I'm <laughs> I decided I because I sh- when I when I did the first movie, like I still continued to work at New Line. I was like, oh, I can just stay because I'm a creature of habit. So I'm like, oh, I'll just stay here at New Line and just write movies for the rest of my life. Um, so um, I had actually r- came up with an, the sequel idea after the second week. I mean, I had the general. I I, I knew what I would want to do with the sequel, but after the second week, when I saw that the numbers were going up, like it was it was a real sleeper hit. Actually, like it. It opened, I think, at number three or four and then climbed the charts and then stayed in the top five, I think, for like a long time. It was it was a sleeper hit. So um, I actually wrote an I- the idea for a sequel. But of course, Hollywood being Hollywood, they met with every other writer in Hollywood for a story. And then they finally came back and said, "Okay, we're going to use your treatment. (laughs) That's so Uh, random. You already had a successful one in the first one. Like, why not? Like, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. What? Yeah. So weird. Yeah. Well, I think part of it, I think part of it was because, A, I didn't move out to Hollywood. You know, like I, I was working in New York. So the Hollywood side of the business is very much kind of who's out here and who can be seen. Um, I know there was also, and an, you know, I just bring this up because it, um, it came up recently because uh, somebody was doing an anniversary edition. But, you know, I also know that, you know, James and Glenn were kind of going around telling everybody that my original treatment had a guy with a hood and a sickle hacking up teenagers and made it sound like they came up with the idea for Invisible Death, which is just bullshit. Um, so th- that was kind of going on out here, but w- which I didn't know about. Um, but the thing I love about the sequel, the sequel actually is my favorite. Um, I was just it, about to ask you, are you happy with how part two ended up being? Oh my God. Yes. And Eric Bress and J Mackie Gruber wrote the, the actual script for it. Mm-hmm. Um, but the reason that I like part two is there's a whole bunch of stuff that I always like in sequels that I got to do. Um, you know, I set up a group of teenagers that you think are going to be the leads and then I kill them all off except for Kimberly. Yeah. So you think they're going to be, t- the teenagers are going to be the leads, and I killed them off. Um, I brought back, you know, some OG players. Originally, I was going to have Devin and um, Allie Larder come back, and um, they couldn't work things out with Devin. Um, otherwise, I probably wouldn't have killed Allie Larder. Like, I killed her in the version where Alex was in it and lived till the end. Um, in the version of part two? Yeah. 
Yeah. Oh, because I always wondered why Devin Salad didn't return because it just seemed. I mean, I, I'm someone who I absolutely love when sequels bring back characters. Yeah. Obviously, you've got attached to them. And of course, I loved Ali Lard in it, but I always wondered it was just like, oh, he got hit by a, what, like a brick off the that, side. Yeah, that was, and that was a, that was like a bullshit thing. I think, I think, I think there were, there were some, there were some problems getting him back for the sequel. And I, so I think somebody at the studio was just trying to be kind of a, if, it felt like a dick move to kind of just be like, oh, he got hit in the head by a brick. But like, just don't tell us what happened to him and then you can bring him back in the future. Right. You know? oh, like well, he's, he's hanging out in Paris. <laughs> well, you know, for all we know, since since it's only a newspaper clipping. Oh, I'm not. I mean, I'm not. This isn't like a secret drop about anything. I'm just saying. <laughs> we just got the scoop. Thank okay, you, Jeffrey. Everybody, everybody. <laughs> Alex is alive. Devin saw was coming back. Thank you. <laughs> no, but I'm just saying since, in my, and you know in horror movies, if you don't see him die on screen, and sometimes when you do see him die on screen. Yeah, um, that's true. Hello, so, Jamie Lee Curtis. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, in my world, because I, it's not canon in the franchise that everybody dies at the end of all the films. What started it James and Glenn came back for part three and they kind of started that, you know, wiping out everybody. And it's on the DVD extras for part three that the survivors for part two died in an accident. Yeah. But it's it, that's a DVD extra. You know, that's not like part of the movie. Like you you never see see that. So even though that's the one thing I'm hoping that they changed with the sixth one, like I'm I'm um I've talked to the writers. They're amazing. Um, and, you know, they were kind of like wanting to know what I thought some of the important kind of DNA kind of things were. And I was like, well, one, Tony Todd, you have to bring Tony Todd. Back. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I said, you know, I would love to kind of reintroduce because my the, the theme that I wanted with Final Destination wasn't that. Yes, you can't cheat death, but I didn't want it to be like, oh, if you cheat death, it's going to kill all of you right away i wanted it to be like you have a chance you never know when it's going to get you but there's a chance that you can still prolong your life so i wanted i said that's the that's the theme of the movie like live life to the fullest not that you know oh if you cheat death it's gonna like wipe you yeah, all like, out i mean what a what a like despair filled like hopeless message if it's like hey you can cheat death but tomorrow you're dying anyway <laughs> yeah <laughs> did you what's this Oh, sorry. And Allie, uh, Allie Larder's character, she was alive for a year in Stony Brook, you know? So, yeah. In so, a padded cell. I mean, it was a fun living. Yeah. <laughs> she was at her meals. There wasn't a bathroom in the cell, I don't think. So I don't know how, how that worked. But no, but she had a lot of patty. I remember, you know, we we were actually going to ask because then you you didn't come back for parts three or four or five. Was there any specific reason that you didn't come back to those? No, I, I mean, I started working on other other stuff, obviously, and I'm very, you know, I love the the franchise. Um, for me, I always think there's so many ways you. For me, I've I keep, I've always, but it's if it's don't if it's not they have the if it's not broke don't fix it kind of mantra. My idea is that death can always have a new design, so we can always maybe change up how death gets people. Um, the Rube Goldberg stuff is great. But I think it would be nice to like take the, you know, I think you could take it into different kinds of directions. Um, so I don't just want to kind of come back and tell another regular. Yeah. <laughs> well, 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 and you said you were talking about, cause obviously there's been talk about the sixth film, which is coming mm -hmm. out. Is there anything you can tell us or that you're allowed to tell us about us or how, like you said, you've spoken to the filmmakers has, and they've been consulting you. Yeah. Is there, what can you tell us if anything? I mean, I, the only thing I can say is what's been announced. <laughs> um, oh. So, uh, you know, <laughs> yeah, no, the, you know, the, um, the, uh, the writer director of Spider-Man um, came up with the story, which was awesome. Um, Guy Busick, um, who worked on the screen, the new scream and, um, oh my God, I'm blanking on her name, Stephanie. Um, oh, I'm blanking on her name. He's got a writing partner. Um, and I talked to both of them and they were just, they were just amazing. Um, and the thing I like about them is they're fans. That's, good, you know, they're, yeah. they're diehard fans. So they're very, um, it's for them, it's important to like make a movie that the fans are going to be happy with, which I think a lot of times you don't get that with filmmakers. I think a lot of times they just want to make a film that they're happy with. Um, and they don't think about the fans as much. So um, I can tell you it's an, it's a new angle 
so it's not just going to be the typical final destination with one rule pop up that's like here's a here's a rule that's different for this movie that kind of it's going to be different than that but it's going to still be very final destination Um, well because i was going to say so the final destination movies have done a plane crash a freeway pile up a roller roller coaster coaster. drag racing accident and a bridge collapse or if you had to pick another major disaster you'd like to see in a future installment what would it be you know what? I have had a hard time. That's the hard. That's the hard part. Like Maybe we had just to- like drag race, like drag. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <I'm just laughs> Not kidding. RuPaul's Drag Race accident. Yeah. A drag racing. That's accident. funny. <laughs> no, it's it's funny. Like, um, I will say what they're. I, I'm not going to say what it is, but what they're what they're planning on this one is a is a new one, which is cool. But even for the second one, like I was going to have a hotel fire. Like the kids were going down to spring break and. They were in a hotel fire and Craig's like, eh. yeah, Craig Perry's like the, I call him the godfather of the franchise. Cause he's, he's been the, the guiding hand and light of it. And, um, he's an amazing producer. And, um, he's like, I got it. We got to come up with something better. And I was driving home to Kentucky and got behind a log truck. Oh. And then I, I pulled, I pulled into the next lane cause I, I never ride behind them. And then it hit me. And then I pulled off the highway and called Craig, like freaking out. He's like, slow down, Jeffrey. I can't understand you. I was like, what about a log on a freeway in the log, yeah, log truck and the chain breaks and the. Lo-? And he's like, that's it. That's the opening. So uh, it's wow. so scary. I don't go near them either. And when I see him, uh, I always think Final Destination Two. I I mean, here's the thing. Something about uh, it's still to this day, the plane crash is still the scariest one for me because there's something about even though I know it is, I know the percentages. It's much more likely you'll get in an auto accident. Something about having zero control while you're on a plane and being above ground is just always terrified me. Oh, I think me. that's uh, not, not me. That's why also like the roller coaster always scare me because every time I'm on a roller coaster, I'm just like wow, I am at the mercy of whoever designed this and check that it was still working. So <laughs> don't go on yeah. the ride. Yeah, I don't like roll. I've always like, but it, that that opening didn't scare me so much, but I've, I've never liked roller coasters. I mean, I'll, I'll ride a roller coaster that goes like that and then goes like that. But I've been I've been on one loop one and that I hated. I just hate them. So, you know, as we mentioned in the intro, you've written a number of other horror movies throughout your career. I know we don't have time to go in depth into all of them, but we'd love to ask you a couple questions about a few of them, if you don't mind. Um, uh, the first up going in kind of chronological order, the, the 2005 witchy revenge thriller Tamara. Um, I have to ask what inspired you to write this film? Like, were you fascinated by witchcraft? Did you love the movie The Craft? What inspired you? <laughs> Now, you know, what inspired me? Um, two things. One, one, I Carrie is one of my favorite movies. Um, Good choice. The I just, I just, I, I, I always hate that you have to wait till the, the end of the movie for her to like kill everybody. So, <laughs> that, so, so, but I think the theme of bullying is just a, something that we can all relate to. And, and, uh, you know, um, and people have been on me about, Right, come up with something else like Final Destination, but then I would come up with other ideas that were kind of considered out there, you know. And they're like, "Well, this is too much like Final Destination, and this one's not fun." And it's like, it's like fucking door, you know. It's like the porridge. It's like I, I don't know what porridge you want. So, <laughs> I like, love that. Come up with something like Final Destination, but not too much like Final Destination. Yeah. Go. So then I decided, like, I wanted to write something fun for myself, and so I was like, I love Carrie. Let me think of a take on Carrie where, you know, this girl's bullied and then she comes back and she's all empowered and sexy. And, and you know, Jenna Dewan, you know, I wish she was more glamorous. You know, she's not beautiful. <laughs> I, we, I know. We're talking about, seriously, she is so beautiful. I know. Even in the scenes when she's nerdy, she's still That's dropped great. in gorgeous. Well, like, the like, funny I, can't, I can't get over how stunning she is. Sorry. Like, but you I, can't control her beauty. <laughs> No, but the funny thing is, like, because um, originally we had uh, Lionsgate was originally going to do the film um, at a at a pretty sizable budget, and then some stuff internally happened, and then um, some independent producers picked it up. and I and I love the team that made the film. It's just we didn't have a budget, and I and I, one of the things I said from the beginning is I really want you to like put you know Jenna Dewan in like makeup and you know make her look unattractive because i said 
I just hate those movies where it's like, oh, she's got glasses on and so she's ugly. <laughs> but, um, but they didn't have the budget to do it. So they just kind of made her down a little bit and they kind of gave her a slight unibrow. And um, I was like, this is the most beautiful nerdy girl I've ever seen. Yeah, in my life. Like, I know she's stunning. And she's, so, she's <laughs> such an amazing, she's just, a, she's amazing too. She reminds me when I watched um, the new Scream, Jenna Ortega's character. Yeah. And the new Scream reminded me of Jenna Dewan and Tamara. And I was like, those they should play sisters in a movie. Oh, totally. it, um, what is she like to, what was she like to work with? Like, uh, um, yeah. Is she just as great as she is beautiful? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And we were shooting, the whole cast was great on that film. Like honestly, and we were shooting in Winnipeg, um, Canada, which is like one of the places in Canada where people are like the worst places to shoot are Winnipeg and some other place, just cause they're really far out in the middle of nowhere. And it was freezing. Um, and poor Jenna had to wear, like you saw, I mean, once she turned, came back for revenge, she wore skimpy outfits and she had this little tiny red dress on for like the last third of the movie. And she had to be out in the free uh, freezing, you know, we had to put every, after every take, they had to put it like a, you know, big like blanket and she, but she never complained. And just as such a sweetheart, the whole cast was amazing. I like to hear that. Yeah, no, that is nice. You know, um, Moving on to the the 2008 loose remake of George A. Romero's zombie classic Day of the Dead. Now, your your film is very different from the 1985 original, mm -hmm. which which isn't a bad thing because yours is like action packed from start to finish. But I, we were wondering, did you purposely set out to make this movie very different from the original? Do you even consider it like a remake? No, oh my, no. Sorry, my cat's in the background. I know. Um, but I, we we love a, your cat. I, um, my boyfriend and I have a black cat also, so I've been like watching your cat in the background. Like, oh, it's like <laughs> our kitty. Um, um, no, no, actually, and this is always this has been, and and I'm always grateful. It's always wonderful to write a movie. Um, but what happened with Day of the Dead is they brought they had already hired Steve Miner. Director of Friday 13th Part 2 and 3. And Halloween H2O. No one cares about don't that And Halloween H2O kidding, and House and a bunch of war. Yeah. I mean, so yeah. the idea to the, the thought of working with Steve was was first of all, like, I've got to I've got to do this. But honestly, like I wrote a pitch that was very faithful to the original. Oh, um, it was it was set in modern times and it still had the same overall kind of thing like, you know, the the army reserve is coming back to this home to, the hometown because of this viral thing but most of my original take took place in the bunker and it was very it was very close to the original and that's what they signed off on for me to write but when i started writing it they they started making me change everything and if you if you read interviews with me when i first got hired to write it I'm like, fans are going to be really excited. You know, I think fans are going to be really happy with it. And if you read later interviews, I was like, it's a movie. Um, because <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm just thinking, what if they were like, hey, can you have like an aspect in there where they cheat death? <laughs> like, no, they, they just throw no they just they just made me change. They had me change so much like they are you a fan of zombie films in general? Yeah. What's your favorite by it? Or is it one of the original George Romero ones or one of the 28 days ones? Or you, do you have a it's, favorite? I don't have a favorite. I mean, again, I think, I think the, well, I, I think the original night of the living dead had such an impact on me because it was so amazing. And then also had a black lead, which is something I'd never seen in a horror film as a young person. So they're um, coming to get you, Barbara. No, they're coming <laughs> to get you. Um, <laughs> And I like Tom Savini's remake of of Night I of did Living. too. I, I think it was good. I, I thought it was very good. Um, but I, you know, I like the Dawn of the. <laughs> this is another thing they did. I love the Dawn of the Dead remake, and they hired Ving Rhames <laughs> to yes. be in the Day of the Dead remake to kind of trick people, I think, into thinking they were connected. Um, and then he becomes a torso. <laughs> I know. I, I, at the end of the day, I think if they had not sold it as a Day of the Dead movie, I think it would have people would have really enjoyed it. It's because I, 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 I am able to separate after you have to you have to start separating yourself from from every project because it's at a certain point it gets out of your your hands. But um, but I wish they hadn't called it the day because I was telling them every step. of the, This is the only thing being a horror fan and a writer is when you're trying to explain to people like the fans are going to kill us. You know, the fans are going to hate that we're remaking this already. And the further we get away from the original, they're going to hate. Cause I set up stuff like Salazar, you know, in the, in the 
in the original you know he had to get his hand cut off because he got bitten yeah and so you know nick cannon he, and also i love nick cannon but he ad-libbed a lot of like homeboy ghetto lines that i think are ridiculous <laughs> but you know there's like this scene where he picks up the, this machete you know at the weapon store and he's like oh this looks like it was made for me and later on he was supposed to get his hand cut off and so they took a lot of this stuff they just got rid of a lot of the connective stuff from the original um and you know one thing i noticed in this it's very different is and i actually something i haven't really seen a lot of zombie movies that in this movie you know the zombies are like incredibly fast jumping over sorts of things crawling on the walls you know very different from the original did you intend to have the zombies have these like superhuman abilities or was that all the studio they were supposed to be fast okay um and i remember i love this is a fun story because this was just like i was on set when they were doing the zombie on the ceiling one <laughs> i call him the spider zombie and i told steve i'm like um this doesn't make any sense because in the next scene the zombies can't get to the air vent. You know, they're trying to jump up to the air vent. And if they can just crawl up a wall and he's like, yeah, but I, you know, I've never seen a zombie like climb up and across the cell. Like, cause that's, cause it doesn't make any sense, Steve. Like don't. And so we got, we didn't get into an argument. It was just a, it was a, it was a playful back and forth about me trying to get, he's like, well, I'm going to shoot. And if it doesn't work, I'll cut it. I'm like, it's not going to work. And it's in the movie. And so everybody's like, what's that zombie crawling across the ceiling? Um, <laughs> So, so, you know, again, like those are those are quibbles. And my other my other big thing that I always defend myself on, because, you know, in the original George set up that the zombies kind of remember part of who they were yeah. um, before. And I made it much clearer in my script that Bud was still fighting against like he was still turning, but because he didn't eat meat. It was a it you know that was a part of who he was so it was able but they kind of cut down all the arc of him turning and just made it like oh he's a vegetarian yeah it's like a and throwaway so, line in the car it, yeah yeah and now and then all of a sudden it, it turns and then he's just not trying to eat anybody and like in the script he he was getting worse and worse and worse you know fighting against the urge to eat people um and now it's like the vegetarian zombie. I'll never live that one down. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, um, moving ahead to the 2016 supernatural thriller, Dead Awake. Now, mm -hmm. um, this one involves people being hunted by this kind of like demonic entity when suffering sleep paralysis. And by the way, you know, sleep paralysis, obviously, you know, this is well, a real thing. Have you thing. ever had sleep paralysis? Uh, just one time, like one minor time. Yeah, well, so, we were. What inspired you to take on a subject like this? Because this is, or I've actually had time. I feel, I feel I, like I have. I haven't had obviously a, a a demon on me during it, but I've had times when you like are in the middle of waking up and you can't move, and it's a really terrifying experience. So, was there anything that inspired you to take on this subject? Uh, you know, uh, uh, Wendy Rhodes, a, a producer, she did Haunting in Connecticut, actually, and another uh, producer, James Gibb, brought me some articles about sleep paralysis and said that, you know, they thought it would make a good movie. And once I started researching, cause I, I do like to try to find subjects that a lot of people can relate to. And I had just not heard about how widespread sleep paralysis was. So I was very fascinated with the concept and the, the idea, you know, I wanted to kind of create is like, the, if you don't know about it and you start believing in it, you'll open yourself up for it. So I, I came up with the idea of having twins, you know, so that one of them, when she dies of sleep paralysis, the other one kind of experiences it enough to get her to start investigating it. And and that movie was a lot of fun as well. I love it. It has is jo Jocelyn Donahue, Jesse oh, Bradford, Bria Bra Grant. Bra Bra and, and Bria Grant's like killing it. Jocelyn's kill They're all, I love all of them. Uh, Lori Jocelyn Petty as a sleep Lori doctor. James Eckhouse from 90210. Oh, yes. Yes. We had a great cast and Philip Guzman's an amazing director. Um, the, the only quibble I have about that movie is because we couldn't, we couldn't afford because originally I wanted the sleep paralysis, you know, the, like just the shadows in the room to like kind of move in around the bed and you could see stuff in the shadows, but you couldn't really see the night hag till later, but we couldn't afford to do that. So we ended up having to create a night hag with makeup, practical makeup. And then you kind of see her too much, you know, you see her too much in my opinion. By the um, way, night hag is also my um, nickname for Tim. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, do you do you keep in contact with anyone from the cast? Yeah, because there's so many. Yeah, no, um, I um, I stay in touch with Jocelyn. Um, you know, stay in touch with Brea. Uh, adore Brea so much. I adore. I and Jesse Bradford is like he's a star. Like I I want to cast him. He's just got. I mean, aside from being incredibly good looking, like he's one of those guys. Like when you watch a movie, like he just. He pops on. And on I, that. I agree. And with Jocelyn Donahue, I'll watch her in anything. But most anything. importantly, are you close friends with James Eckhouse? <laughs> um, Mr. No, Walsh. I, I, I stayed in touch with him. I try to stay in touch with with. It's hard in this business because everybody, you know, you do become like a family um, when you're working on a film and then but you all move off to, to your next films. Of course. Um, of course. I'm, Philip Guzman and I are are very the director are very close. I I um he peed another film for him sleep no more and and he's just a super talented guy um yeah uh it, it is there is a funny story because i i love to gossip um i'm sure you all appreciate this oh we love um, gossip go on <laughs> but originally for the guy for, for the actor who played his song we we cast i forget the the guy's name but he's he was in avatar um I think he's an Indian actor. He was an avatar. And in the script, obviously, the character of Hassan is like not been sleeping for almost a year and is about to lose his mind and about to die. So the actor shows up um, fresh from vacation and he usually has had a beard, like a long kind of script. And he'd completely shaved and he looked like he looked he looked healthier than everybody in the movie. <laughs> and he would not let them put makeup on him to make him look bad. Because he's like, I'm tired of being cast as like, you know, the ugly guy in a movie. And it's like, you picked the wrong movie. <laughs> yeah. That's it, so insane because isn't that like part of an actor's job? Yeah. So we had to fire <laughs> so we had to fire him. And then luckily <laughs> the guy who plays us on is fucking amazing. So everything works out well. But um it it was just funny. It it was because a guy shows up on set and everybody's like, Are you fucking kidding me? Like, you just went on vacation, so he's already olive skin, but now he's like super glowy. And he looks amazing. You're like, and, you look too good for this role. Yeah, Next. Ready for yeah. your photo shoot. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, they tr they shot two days with him. And he was even arguing about wanting bags under his eyes. And so finally, the second day, they just uh, they sent him home. Wow. You Which know, I think it's good because uh, productions, uh, most productions won't do that. They'll like, they'll like bend over backwards once they've hired somebody. But I'm, I'm very much of the thing is like, if you sign on for a role, Get ready to look terrible. Yeah, well, no. yeah especially in a movie about yeah. sleep paralysis. Yeah, yeah, right? like, yeah. When you're the guy who's like one foot in the grave, yeah, you can't look like healthier than your leads. <laughs> you no know, random question before we get to "Don't Look Back," um, where mm -hmm. um, your directorial debut. As a screenwriter, I've always wondered: Do you always attend the entire movie shoot? Because you know, obviously, you're the writer, but um, do you usually like? Would you usually about all the movies that you worked on be around for the entire shoot? No, and I, it, it's usually pr a production decision, and most of the time, writers aren't on set. Mm -hmm. Um, maybe for studio films they are, but the reason, and I know the psychology behind it is the reason is they're worried. Directors are worried that the writer is going to come on and start being like, well, that's not how I wrote, you know what I'm saying? Cause once you hand a movie over to a director, unless they're really collaborative, it's their vision after they get this. So, so they can rewrite the script. They can shoot it how they want. They can do whatever they want. Um, but because I've been in the business so long, I, I always make it very clear to everybody, like, look, I'm coming to set because I want to be there. Like, this is fun for me. I'm not going to step on any toes. I'm not going to be like, hey, this isn't how I wrote. So I was kind of I, I've been very fortunate where I've been a allowed to go to the set of all my films. That's really cool. Um, yeah, I would walk in and say, this isn't my vision. Go on. <laughs> well, I was going to say, so lastly, we wanted to chat about the horror movie that was your feature film directorial debut 2020s don't look back which you also wrote um and after doing a little research we saw that this began as a short film that you wrote and directed called good samaritan can you tell us yeah. how that evolved from a short to a feature film and where the idea for that came from well it's actually um i had the i i wrote the script first oh. uh, the feature script and then i did the short because i wanted to show that i could direct horror and the idea for Good Samaritan came from, I had read this Kitty Genovese story 
it's from the I think it was from the eighties maybe um, about a woman in um, in New York who was assaulted in a courtyard and kind of the urban legend that's c- come out over the over the decades was that you know forty people like heard her screaming for help and nobody called the police and it turned so when I heard that story I was just like it just stuck with me all the time about yeah how it people- stuck with me and especially at the beginning of the movie when you had clips of real fights going on and no, everyone just standing there. I, yeah. I just have to ask, were those real clips and how yeah. did you get them? Wow. Yeah. Those were, those were real clips. We, we, um, we, um, we got, we bought, you know, we bought the rights to, to use real clips. Wow. It's just crazy. You know, you think about, I think it's easy to say, Oh, I would never just stand around and do and do nothing. But like, I wonder, I, I would hope that I would do something if witnessing a crime like that, you know? Yeah. Well, I would we'll, freeze for sure. Oh, Tim would run the other way. I'm terrible. <laughs> I'm really terrible. But what happened, what, what was interesting is when I was flying to locations, this was another situation where originally we had a studio that was going to do the film for like $5 million, and we ended up doing it for way, way, way less than that because the, the studio went up, quit doing films. But um, <laughs> um, when I was going down to Location Scout, there was a documentary on Kitty Genovese that debunked a lot of the urban legend because apparently people did call to help. I mean, it's, it was a horrible crime. Like the guy assaulted her, went away, came back and found her. She'd crawled into a stairwell and killed her. Oh. Um, but people did call for help. There was somebody who was with her when she died, you know? Um, so people, a reporter had sensationalized the story, but that idea that people, cause there have been a couple of times where I've, Try, there was one time when I saw a guy like screaming at his girlfriend and this is back when I drank and I was drunk, you know, and I went up and started yelling at the guy and then he kicked me in the nuts. Um, oh, God. I know it was like the weirdest thing. Like, I'm I'm like, OK, this guy's going to take a swing at me. So we're going to get in a fight. And he kicked me in the nuts. And then his friends like pulled him back and they're like, Arr! and then I, I kind of walked off and I just yelled back at the girl. You know, you could do better than that, that asshole. And then, yeah, my nuts were really sore. Um, <laughs> well, we know the outcome is that you're okay. So that was yeah. nice of you to step in. Yeah, no, but. Yeah. I, but yeah, what I've noticed, the thing that I noticed that that is still really shocking and it's more of our, our culture today is people's first instinct now when they see something bad happening is to film it. Yeah. Um, yeah. They don't about call. that phone? They don't, but they don't call 911 first. Like it's like fucking call 911, then film it. But no, yeah. everybody wants to film it. So sadly, I don't think that the, um, I don't think that the, the problem is going away. I think it's it's always going to be there. You know, it's kind of just a people lacking empathy, and we've certainly, you know, civility's gone out the window with you know politics and society now, um, and. I'm very proud of the film of how it turned out. I've always, I've, I've had to very push, you know, because, and I hate people that, that say a horror film is like more of a thriller. Oh, it's really a thriller. It's not really a horror film, but this one I wrote is more of a thriller because you, I couldn't show because the whole idea is, is somebody after them physically or is it like karma or is it a, like, is it super, like you don't know what's killing them. So I couldn't show the murders mm-hmm. of the people who witnessed the assault because Otherwise, you would have to give away what's going on. So it doesn't have the traditional horror, you know, kill scenes in there that I that I would normally put in something like that. Um, so I did the short because with the short, I went straight up supernatural mm-hmm. so that it it was scary. And I think with with the, the feature film, um, it walks that line because it's more of a mystery. She's trying to unravel like what's doing this uh, you know is it supernatural is it real um and um did you feel like there were and i feel like this probably is an obvious question but just um to get your thoughts on it did you feel like there were definite connections between this and final destination just with that unseen force kind of thing or do you do yeah you, yeah well originally my original take on this um was going to be that it was karma so like for the reasons that each person had for not helping kind of came back on them like with a vengeance and killed them. This was one of the, not to date it, but this is one of the ideas that I gave to New Line where Bob's like, I love it, but it's too much like Final Destination. <laughs> uh, so um, Wendy, um, uh, Wendy Rhodes, who worked on Dead Awake with me also 
originally worked on this with me and she's like well why don't instead of going straight up supernatural why don't you play with the idea that we don't know if it's supernatural or a killer and and go a mystery route so i decided to take it away from the kind of karmic the karmic version would have been a lot splat more splattery and um I'm, I'm hoping maybe i'll get a chance to do another one where i can do a karmic splattery one or maybe i'll just do another movie about karma i don't know well and what was it like stepping in the director's chair for this do you think you'll continue directing in the future um i definitely will i have a couple of projects that i 100 percent want to direct um my my friends told me like with directing it's one of those things that when you do it you'll either be like all right never want to do that again or i'll do that again so I, i'm definitely fall into the i'll do that again category it was a, it was a it was a I'd been on a lot of, I'd been on so many sets that I thought it would be, I thought I knew how it would be, but you don't really know until you're doing it, especially when it's an indie film, Mm -hmm. um, because all bets are off (laughs) when you're shooting like on an indie budget, like you have to deal with crazy shit almost every day, like losing locations or something not working or this happening. Um, Wow, he is just... He, I love your kitty. I know. Really is interested in these answers. Though. I know. I mean, I love it. <laughs> you know, um, um, we just have a, a few final, like, additional questions for you, if you uh, uh, don't mind. I mean, and I was just thinking, you know, just because we're all out gay men here and this what? kind of thing interests me, was there and I uh, was there ever a point in your career where you felt like you couldn't be open about your sexual orientation, or that it would affect you getting hired? I don't think, I mean, I've never been in the closet um, because New Line was very accepting in New York. I'm sure that it did keep me from certain work. You know, one of my friends um, who's an amazing guy, Paul Etheridge, um, did his first film like Hellbent. Hellbent. Yes, yeah, of and, course. I'm familiar. He's a cutie. Oh, he is. <laughs> he's, a, and he's a sweetheart and he's super talented. And, you know, again, again especially for like your first film with no money. Um, I remember seeing Hellbent before I even met him and I was so like impressed because that was the first time I felt like I was watching a movie with real gay people as opposed to like a stereotypical, you know, they, it felt like gay people. Um, But like, I know like with, with that film, like that was his first film. And then people were like, you know, his agent would send, send it out and they're like, I don't want to watch this gay film. You know what I'm saying? So um, I, I'm sure that it has held me back maybe in places where I don't know, um, where it's been a little more frustrating is, is when I've tried to include gay and lesbian characters in my scripts. Um, and they've been de gay, like in Tamra, uh, Chloe, the, the female lead is a, le- in my script was a lesbian. Like if you watch the finished film, you know, you see that Jesse has a thing for her, but it never goes anywhere. Yeah. And you're kind of like, why don't these two ever hook up? It's like, cause she's a lesbian. Um, and her thing was going to be that her parents, Tamara put a spell on her parents and they show up at the hospital and try to kill her. And they were like, oh, we can't afford the parents. So we're just going to cut that subplot um, of her being a lesbian. And, and then also the scene with the jocks, the scene I always get, this is, this is the only thing I, uh, that, stre- that angers me of my films. Um, Cause in the script, it was very clear that the, jock guy and his friend were date raping women so when Tamara puts a spell on them in the script she made sean rape patrick and it was you know and i remember it was in the script nobody had any problems with it and then i get a call the day before they're shooting and they're like well how much do you are we should we show in this and i said well it's a rape scene it's so whatever you would show if you were showing a woman getting raped just show shoot it like that and then i saw what they did because the actors pushed out and um, and everybody pushed out on it. So now it's like Tamara kisses both of the guys and then they start making out. Yeah. And then you see them later under the sheets, but they've got their clothes on, like they're kissing under the sheets with clothes on. So yeah. it changed the whole, it changed the whole meaning of that punishment where people are like, I've read reviews where like, Oh, and she made the jock gay. And it's like, no, that's not when she, 
So, yeah, and I feel like uh, hopefully, I mean, maybe if that movie were made today, obviously mm-hmm. they would show it differently because 2005, so much has changed in that. But which yeah. leads me to another question in, in relation to that. This is the serious portion of the interview, Jeffrey. Um, okay. What are your um, your personal thoughts on jobs available to LGBTQ plus writers and directors right now, or more specifically, LGBTQ plus writers and directors um, um, or people of color? Do you feel like things have improved in terms of job availability for writers and directors yeah they they've definitely improved a lot and i think it's a it's a it's a nuanced conversation that we have to have because i i I don't think most people realize how far we've come in such a short time um again the 90s weren't that long ago yeah and one thing that people don't understand that don't work in the business is especially for actors um and a lot of writer directors like white and straight have always been the default for roles. Like when you'd send out a casting notice for 10 high school students, they would send you all white actors and actresses. Like you would, even if you like, I, I even in final destination, like I wrote one of the kids cause it was set in New York. And I said, the ca- the class needs to be diverse because it's New York. Yeah. Um, and they ended up with all white kids. And it's like, even if you write a, per- a character of color, casting agents would send in just their white talent. So what's happened now? And they would always say, well, we always, we went with the best actor or actress for the role. It's like, well, <laughs> you went with the best actor and you went with the best white actor and actress and straight yeah. actor and actress for the role. Um, because you didn't look at this whole other pool of talent. So what we're do what we've seen now is people are saying, oh, wow, there've always been these great, you know, gay and lesbian actors and actresses you know, trans actors, black actors, Latino, Asia, every right. Like we never looked into, we only looked into this one big pool of white talent. And so now we're actually widening our spotlight and looking at other talented people. So I know for a lot of, there's always pushback whenever you have any kind of positive social movement. And I know that, you know, I hear some, a lot of my, my straight white friends complaining now that they, you know, well, I can't get work now because, you know, all the jobs are going it's like well but you have to realize like since the beginning of cinema all the jobs went to straight white people i think you'll be fine you'll be fine (laughs) you'll be fine for this little period of time where people are actually starting to appreciate and the one thing i i have to give new line especially original new line under bob shea is um i can't credit him enough for what he did for cinema because he put out movies back in in the in the 90s like House Party, um, Friday, Blade. You know, he did the first Black Marvel superhero movie when people were like, who wants to see a black vampire hunter? Um, Me Familia, he he did movies for the LGBT community. Um, Fine Line Features did My Own Private Idaho. Like, um, they, Bob was very, Bob knew that there were so many people out there that weren't seeing themselves represented on film and made sure to do that way before it became like you know decades before it became like a regular thing and the the fact is people don't care like i use black panther as an example because black panther is probably the blackest movie you'll ever see as far as like the actors are black and a lot of them are dark skinned which is another issue you know colorism in the in the film industry um the costume designs the music everything is african You know, it's the blackest movie. And it was one of the most successful Marvel movies ever around the world. And people keep saying, well, it's a Marvel movie. I'm like, yeah, but it's one of the biggest. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So people want a good story. And I don't think they care who it is because we're all human at the end of the day. And we all have the same fears and the same wants and the same desires. So I think it's important to tell stories that are specific to you know, communities so that they can relate to like, this is a problem in our community or this is a thing that we deal with. But I think also just representation is important because the thing is we're just all people like I'm one of the films I'm going to be directing is a slasher film where the cast is, is 99% people of color. And the way I describe it is is like, it's, it's like scream, but instead of focusing on all the pretty white kids hanging out over here, we just move the camera over there and focus on all the pretty black and brown people and you know there's a gay character as well and you know he's a main character and he doesn't die i don't want to spoil it but 
Um, <laughs> is he is he seventeen? Is he um, can I audition? Yeah, yeah. Do you need a four, do you need a forty five year old gay man Tim hey, wants to no. audition? Oh. No. no, I he think that's great. I, I, I think that's a great um great answer and hopefully representation um not only gets better for people in front of the camera but behind the camera too. You know, yeah. all roles and, and so. that's been happening. That's been happening as well. And and there are great directors like you know somebody like Ernest Dickerson, um who um you know we, we've got something bubbling together. Um, great director. Demon Knight was amazing. He's done so many other things as well, but you look at his TV stuff and he's directed, you know, some of the best episodes of Raised by Wolves. I mean, he, you know, there are so many talented directors out there, you know, that are finding thankfully new life in TV, but hopefully that will translate into, into the genre stuff as well. Okay. Um, shifting gears just a bit. Um, do you go to horror conventions or do you like to attend them? Yeah. Yeah, I always because, you know, especially as a right when you're a writer, um, writers don't get a lot of recognition in Hollywood. You know what I'm saying? It's like in TV, like as it should be, the writers like the top of the totem pole because it all starts with the script. But over the years, like the, you know, back in the 70s, when the directors were auteurs, they started getting their names put above the title of film. So then all of a sudden it became about the directors and the stars and, you know, they forget in Hollywood. Well, they don't forget. That's why they negotiate the writers guild deal last after the directors and the actors, because they know the writers are essential. Um, but they can fuck us over if they get the directors and writers to sign off on an agreement that doesn't protect writers. Um, but I love going to conventions because especially in the horror community, horror fans like know everybody, you know, they know the key, yeah. they know the grips and the stuntmen and the writers. So I love going to the conventions and connecting with fans. It, it, it makes me very happy. That's awesome. No, we're happy to hear that. But as fans, especially we, anybody we talk to, a lot of the people we talk to have gone to conventions. Some people um, are thinking about it, but always hearing good things about just like how the loyalty and the love from the fans at horror conventions, because there really is, like you were saying, there are not conventions for romantic comedies or yeah. Yeah, there's, 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 uh, sleepless in Seattle. Yeah, comedies, there's yeah. not conventions. <laughs> there's a reason for that. You know, we, um, first off, th this has been really, really, great Jeffrey we have just one um one final question for you which is something we ask every single person we interview and um you've told us so much amazing stuff that I feel like we even have answers to this already but I'm gonna ask um this specifically um what is, yeah oh well, it's not not it's actually not I too, mean, no, if no, you no, want it to what, what is one <laughs> thing he, he totally just, that was a gutter joke and you just totally <laughs> Wait, wait, wait! What happened? Did I? I, said, I missed no, a, no, I missed. I said, I said, no, I said versatile. Is oh, the oh, I thought you said personal. I thought you said personal. So I oh, no, I said versatile. <laughs> with, this is what we ask all of our, your sexual position. No, yes. no. What is one thing that you can tell us about your experience working on? Let, let's just say Final Destination, um, since it might be too difficult to choose from all of your films. One thing that you've never told any other interviewer, publication, or podcaster. It can be it can be either something juicy, something tiny, but just one thing about your experience working on it that you've never told in any other interview before. Hope we didn't put you on the spot. No, I don't think I told this in an interview. Um, well, I went I went to visit the set with my boyfriend and they put us in one of those like longer trailers where there's other rooms in there. Um, I like where this is going. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, well, no, that didn't happen. Um, <laughs> um, but two people that were working on the film, it was their last day of shooting and they came in and they started fucking next door. <laughs> They didn't know we were there. They didn't know we were there. And yeah, they Wait, started... are we talking cast members or crew members? I'm not going to say any more detail than that. <laughs> okay, That's, a good, okay. that's a good one. Keep it as vague as possible. So yeah, so they, yeah, we heard them and they were like, what's going on in there? And all of a sudden we heard moaning and then some stuff fell over and then the music got turned up real loud. I'm like, they're fucking. <laughs> um, <laughs> that is amazing. You may have gotten the reward for best reveal from all the people we've we ever have heard all sorts of things from like people have answered this question with really juicy stuff um and some people have been like, like hey i like to make movies yeah or like <laughs> i had a meal one day that was this so that is a really good one unexpected <laughs> but unexpected. i i will say it's not it's not like you're who you would it's not like Devin or ali Lar i don't want to like start no, it no, it no, wasn't it's just it, people on a movie it was it definitely wasn't it definitely wasn't 
this cast. Uh, yeah. The, no, no, I'm, I'm not totally saying it wasn't. I'm not saying it wasn't the cast. I just don't. Well, I don't totally get it. We know it was yeah. Sean William Scott. I was gonna. Oh, I would. <laughs> I would have walked in on that. Um, I would have walked in on that. That's amazing. Well, Jeffrey, seriously, this has been so much fun and you've been an incredible guest and it's just been so great being able to talk to you about all these different amazing films. Yeah, so much like, fun. like I said, you are a total inspiration to horror writers, horror people, horror um, everything, you know, just because of everything you've worked on. So thank you for taking thank the time. Thank you with so us. much. I really appreciate it, guys. Yes. Well, we hope to stay in touch with you and we Absolutely. look forward to seeing what comes next from you. Okay. I will let you know. Thank you so much. All right. My thank pleasure, you. guys. Take care. Bye-bye, Jeffrey. Take care. Bye. Bye. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Happy Horror Time. This podcast is hosted by Matt Emmer and myself, Tim Murdoch, and co-produced and edited by Jacob Randall. We now release episodes every Monday, and in each episode, we either review horror movies that just came out or interview stars and insiders from iconic horror films. You can stream all our episodes directly from our website, that's happyhorrortime.com, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And remember... Our reviews do contain spoilers, so we always post the movies we're discussing a few days in advance on our social media pages so listeners can check them out ahead of time. And speaking of social media, make sure you follow our pages on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Happy Horror Time. We even started putting our interviews up on YouTube along with our horror short film, Come In. You've got to check it out. You can find us on YouTube by searching for Happy Horror Time. If you'd like to support the podcast, please sign up to be a patron at patreon.com slash happy horror time. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash happy horror time. Patrons get access to our growing library of monthly bonus episodes and other fun benefits like ad-free episodes that are out a day in advance, our monthly newsletter, participation in polls, and autographed Happy Horror Time stickers! Woo! And if you'd like to contact us, please send us an email at happyhorrortime at gmail.com. Tell us what you love, how sexy you think we are, whatever! I'm Matt Emmer. And I'm Tim Murdoch. And, and we, we hope, hope you have, have a happy, happy horror time! time.